Folks, welcome back to another episode of Mayhem in the Mid-South. Our episode today, Deadly Friendship. Now it's June 1993, so about four months later, Audrey Spain, she lives in an apartment there in Charlotte, and it's the 23rd of the month. Now she is supposed to be at work that night, Taco Bell over on Wendover Road. Now she didn't show up. The manager thought that was very unusual. So he drove by her apartment, and he saw her car there in the parking lot. So he calls Miss Spain, leaves a message on the answer machine. The next day, the manager drives by again, her car's still there. So then the manager, he calls Miss Spain's sister, leaves a message saying, hey, really concerned about your sister. Now, Miss Spain didn't show up again for work that evening. Now, the sister never returned the manager's call, so the manager, he calls the police. Now, the officers drove by the apartment, knocked on the door. They didn't get a response. Now, they didn't kick the door in and force entry because they've got nothing to go on to, to justify exigent circumstances. Now, on the 25th of June, 1993, maintenance people from the apartment complex, they go in the apartment through the sliding glass door. I don't know if they were there to do anything or if somebody had told them, hey, go over there and check, but... In any event, they go in there and they find Miss Spain's body on the bed. So the police are called. So now we have another autopsy, 26th of June, Dr. Sullivan. In fact, I believe Dr. Sullivan's going to do all of the autopsies on all these victims. He noticed there was a ligature made from a t-shirt and a bra, and it's around Miss Spain's neck. And she's got a t-shirt stuffed in her mouth. Now there's also other physical signs of that would point to strangulation. He also notices there are some minor blunt trauma injuries to the facial area. So the M.O. is holding about how he attacks and how he kills the victims. So, of course, Dr. Sullivan comes out and says cause of death strangulation. Now, when the defendant confessed to this killing, by the way, the he confessed to 11 killings and police charged him on nine. And again, we're only going to cover the nine he was convicted of. Now, the defendant says he went by Miss Spain's house to hang out. But now, he said the only reason he went over there was he was he needed money. But I don't think that's all of it. Uh, I think there's more to it. He just wants money for crack. I think he likes killing. I think he also especially enjoys killing people that trusted him. This is a sick, sick individual, obviously. So now, same thing applies. He gets in behind the victim, chokes her. Now, while he's got his clutches on her, he wants her to tell him what's the combination for the safe at her workplace. I believe she was also a manager at that uh, Taco Bell, or an assistant manager anyway. The defendant believes she has knowledge of the combination for the safe. Now, she says she doesn't. So the defendant, he chokes her out till she passes out, carries her to the bedroom, rapes her. He put her in the shower to wash off any evidence. Then he placed Miss Spain in the bed and he tied the t-shirt and bra ligature around her neck. Now, the defendant took Miss Spain's keys and a Visa credit card. Now, he used that Visa card to purchase gas. Now, he later returned to the apartment and made some phone calls. He was thinking that would make it look like the time frame of her death would be later than what it actually was. Now, of course, first question I want to ask is, I wonder if they ever bothered to check her credit cards and see if they had been used. Then you go to the place where the gas is purchased or where any purchases are done and see if you can get video. But anyways. It's August 1993. 
Valencia Jumper. She's a senior at Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte. Now, she's studying political science. Now, she's going to school and she's working two jobs. She works at the food line on Central and she works at Hex department store there in the South Park Mall. August 10th, a friend of Miss Jumper's, he shows up at her apartment. Now, he knows the smoke coming from, from the apartment. So he tried the door knob and the door was unlocked, so he went in. He stated there was a whole bunch of smoke. It was too much smoke for him to enter the apartment. Now, this boyfriend, he then alerts neighbors who called the fire department. Now, the fire department gets in there. They knock the fire down. Now, they notice that there's a burner left on the stove. Now, the fire investigators believe the fire originated from a pot left burning on the stove. Firefighters do find Miss Jumper's body in the bedroom of her apartment. Now, this one here, the autopsy is done on August 10th. Now, Dr. Sullivan, I'm afraid he had a bad day this day. Now, he looks at the body. And now, and you would think this w- was odd, that the, there's a lot of smoke and a little fire in the kitchen, but Miss Jumper's body and part of the bedroom area burnt really badly so, so you just wonder how the fire jumped from the kitchen to the to the bedroom but in any event her, her body is badly burned now, according to the evidence at the scene the fire fighters had said there was a pot of beans left on the stove so that's what the medical examiner is looking at he's looking at that and he's trying to compare that to the condition of the body there was no soot in Miss Jumper's airway now, that indicates there was no significant inhalation of smoke during the fire. In other words, she ain't a, she's not breathing. Now, you would think that'd tell you something. Okay, she doesn't have smoke in her lungs. That she's not breathing, so she's dead before the fire. But anyway, I, I don't know Latin. I'm not qualified to do medical stuff. Now, I further finds out there's no carbon monoxide in Miss Jumper's blood. And again, you would think, no carbon monoxide would tell you she wasn't breathing smoke into her lungs. But anyways, he lists cause of death as thermal burns. Now, after the defendant confesses, Dr. Sullivan would go back, re-examine the autopsy, and amend it to Miss Jumper's death from thermal burns to death by strangulation. Now, the defendant... He said that him and Miss Jumper were very close. She was like a little sister to him. And they spent a lot of time together. He says he went by the apartment and shot the breeze with her and then he leaves. Then he comes back to the apartment. She lets him in. He says, well, I gotta gotta call my girlfriend because we got into a fight. So as soon as she turns her back on him, he put her in a chokehold, took her to the bedroom. So he rapes her. Then the defendant put a towel around Miss Jumper's neck and he choked her to death. The defendant said he took a few minutes to wipe fingerprints from around the apartment where, where he thought he might have touched something. Now he noticed there was a, in the kitchen there was a bottle of rum. So he took that bottle of the bedroom and poured the rum on the victim's body and on the floor nearby. Then he went back in the kitchen, he opened a can of beans, put the beans on the pot in the stove, and he turned the stove on high. And he took the battery out of the smoke detector. I don't know what he did with the battery, because you wonder if that was checked by either the fire department or the police. It would be unusual for people to take a battery out of a smoke detector, but it'd be one of those things you'd wonder, huh? So then the defendant, after he gets the battery out of the smoke detector, he goes back in the bedroom, lights a match, and he throws it on the victim's body, and he leaves the apartment. Now, he returned about 20 minutes later just to make sure that the, the apartment was burning somewhat. So he sees all the smoke, and he keeps on driving, and he goes home. Now, he did take jewelry from Miss Jumper's body, and he pawned it at a local pawn shop. That's uh, something else you'd wonder about if 
of course, the condition of the body, you might not really notice if you had any jewelry on or if any was missing. That's the only thing I could think of as to why they wouldn't check, because if you got a victim missing items like jewelry, that's the first thing you're going to do is check the pawn shops, but they probably couldn't tell whether she had jewelry on or not. Now, it's September 1993. Michelle Stimson, she lives there in an apartment in Charlotte. She's got two sons. On the 15th of September 1993, a friend of hers is, stops by the apartment to visit with her and the kids. Well, he knocks on the door, nobody answers. Well, he hears the kids knocking on the window, and he looks and sees them. And they're hollered at him through the window saying that mama's asleep on the kitchen floor. So now he's thinking they're just playing a game. But he keeps on knocking. Miss Stinson doesn't answer the door. So he's getting ready to leave. The oldest child opens up the back door, gets him by the hand, leads him inside. So he picks the child up and he goes in the apartment through the back door and he noticed sure enough Miss Stimson's laying on the kitchen floor. There appears to be some blood around her. Now he picks up the phone to call and realizes the cord has either been cut or jerked out of the wall. So he grabs the kids and he goes to a neighbor and they call the police. Now our dear friend Dr. Sullivan does the autopsy on the 16th of September. Now he discovers four stab wounds in the left side of the back. Now, two of the four stab wounds cause injury to the heart and lungs and were potentially fatal. He also notices there's signs of ligature strangulation to the throat area. There's other physical signs of the face that would indicate that Miss Stinson was strangled. So now he lists the cause of death as stab wounds to the chest, strangulation as a contributing cause. Now, the defendant would later confess that he stopped by Miss Stinson's apartment at about 11 p.m. Now, he said in this particular case, he was going by there. He specifically went there to rape her and to murder her. Didn't say anything about the fact that he's got that crack problem. So I'm sure taking something probably had something to do with it as well. So the defendant chokes her out, rapes her. And then he finally, he strangles her until death occurs. Now, before the defendant left the apartment, the oldest son had woke up. The defendant told him to go back to bed. So the defendant went through the back door. And uh, it was during the time he was strangling her that he had taken a knife and stabbed her a few times. He doesn't really explain why he used a knife in this particular one. Now, he said he used a towel to wipe off fingerprints from the areas of the apartment and the doorknob. He said he threw the knife and the washcloth over the fence near the back of Miss Stimson's apartment. Now, I didn't see anything that showed that the police recovered that knife or that washcloth. Very unfortunate. February 1994, Vanessa Mack. Now, she lives in an apartment. She's got two young daughters. Now, she worked at Carolina's Medical Center. Now, 20th of February, 1994, grandmother to Miss Mack's oldest daughter, she went to pick up one of the daughters because she was going to babysit while Miss Mack went to work. She arrived at 6 a.m., she went to the back door, but the door was ajar. So she goes in. She notices that Miss Max's four-month-old daughter is lying on the couch, which she thought was very unusual. She entered the bedroom and saw Miss Max's body on the bed. She called 911. So the fire department and the police show up. Now the arriving officers notice there was a towel around Miss Max's neck and what appeared to be some trauma to the head. So he also noticed there was a pocketbook with the contents of it scattered all over the bed. 
Dr. Sullivan does the autopsy 21st of February, 94. And again, he notices that there's some evidence of blunt trauma as well as obvious evidence of strangulation. Now, the ligature was made from a long sleeve pullover shirt and a towel. Now, there's other physical signs of strangulation to the victim's face. So he lists her cause of death as strangulation. Now, later when the defendant confessed to this one, he's just riding around because he's constantly looking to make a little bit of money for his crack addiction. So he calls her house. She answers, and he hangs up. Then he parks and he walks over there to her apartment. Now, in this one here, he tells the police he wanted to rob her and that obviously he was going to murder her after he got the money or valuables. So now the defendant, same M.O., starts choking her out. Now he gets her back to the bedroom and he wants any and all money she's got. And then he wants her ATM card. Then he wants the PIN number. So he gets all that. He rapes her. Then he chokes her to death. So he leaves the apartment. Now later on he tries to use the ATM card at several banks. But he has discovered the PIN number is not correct. So the victim gave the wrong PIN number. And again, of course, I got a question. I, I'm not much about ATM cards. I've got one, but I, my understanding is you try to use an ATM card even if a transaction's not successful, that it should it should pop up, you would think, but I don't know, because you certainly would think the ATM card's missing if you did an inventory of the victim's items what's missing but that'd be something you would check on 